Um, thanks very much for uh, coming back. Um, I'm Ivan Oransky. I have uh, been here all day. I'm a member of the uh, of Pills, and, and very happy to happy to be. I'm the um, I'm the co-founder of Retraction Watch. I'm also the vice president, and global editorial director at MedPage today, um, both based in New York. Um, what we're going to do in the next uh, little while today is talk about. We're still going to flip around some of the conversations we've been having today. Um, you know, I, another way to think about that is we're going to actually, we've put a bunch of journalists up here to sort of throw the darts that some of you have been, I think, throwing maybe a little bit off to the side to some of our, our other panelists. Um, and I think some of what we're going to do is really going to, uh, one thing we're not going to do, by the way, is have slides. Uh, we don't have anything against slides. I often use slides. But what we want to do is really have a conversation. And the conversation really is going to center on, again, obviously trust and science. But really, very specifically, and we're going to broaden from this, but very specifically, we're going to start with a question of how do journalists, how do reporters choose sources? Because really what choosing a source is about is who do you trust? And there may be some other reasons why we choose sources. We're going to talk about those. But that's what we want to talk about today. Um, I was reminded, though, and I think we're bringing together a lot of the themes that we've been talking about today. I was reminded by a couple comments uh, of a story um, that actually sounded a lot like uh, what Dr. Holt was saying about his experience in Congress. And actually, I was also r reminded of uh, by Erica Sugart about uh, Ebola and the flu and, and all of this coming up. Uh, so I'm at MedPage today. And I trained as a physician, but I am not a practicing physician. Uh, haven't seen any patients, at least not officially, uh, in about 15 years, 16 years. <laughs> Um, no, although it comes in, my psychiatry training comes in very handy uh, as a manager, I will say. Um, sorry, oh, we're, we're live, aren't we? Sorry. Um, uh, so uh, one of the things that happened when Ebola, uh, you know, when the Ebola story broke, of course, we're all familiar with that, uh, particularly when some cases starting arriving uh, here in, in the U.S., was that uh, because I'm part of a company called Everyday Health, the med page today is owned by Everyday Health, um, radio stations, television would start calling and be interested in talking to our quote unquote experts about Ebola. And at first it was Ebola, then it was the flu. And so I said, oh, great, you know, it's, it's actually good to have our expertise out on the air. I actually believe in that. We can talk about whether that's a good idea. I said, let's, you know, let's put out our, let's put forward our expert who is somebody who has been covering. Uh, infectious diseases, Ebola in particular, uh, HIV, all infectious diseases, really knows this stuff uh, for more than 20 years. He's actually a Canadian. Um, we have lots of Canadians here today in, in, in spirit. Um, and the response we got back from all of our, all of these potential interviewers, so television, radio, was, um, well, that's very nice, but we need a doctor. And we said, well, we don't have a doctor who's actually an infectious disease specialist. That's who we'd want to put out there. Uh, maybe a public health special, you know, somebody who really knows this stuff. Uh, no, we, we need a doctor. And so I ended up getting volunteered to do this. So um, apologies to any of you who saw me on this, what turned into a sort of media tour on MSNBC and all sorts of tons of local radio all around the country. Um, I did have my sort of, you know, hello Cleveland moment when I said something, I did like eight of these in one day, and I said, um, and then someone was interviewing me from uh, San Francisco, and, and I said, well, you know, as whatever the person's name was, you know, as I'm sure your listeners in Portland know, and I was just like, wow, I'm, I think I'm done with this. Um, I tell that story because I find it amusing, so now you've had to listen to it, but, um, you know, it very much speaks to who is a source, who is a trusted authority. What do credentials mean? What does credibility mean when journalists look for sources? And that's really uh, how we're going to, to frame this and talk about it. Uh, and then we're going to also, I think, answer, try and answer a question that, that Rick asked me uh, over lunch. He said, you know, and I, I'm springing this on all you guys, but I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it as we, as we sit here. Um, really, you know, how relevant is the media anymore, or at least the media that we represent? And I'll tell you in a second who we represent and how I think it's a, a really cool combination of people uh, in terms of perspectives. Uh, how relevant are we in terms of creating public trust in science or creating public distrust in science? Or, you know, we've got an atomized media and all of that, but I, I think for reasons you'll see, this is a good group to discuss that. So 
Very briefly, uh, introductions before I sort of pose the question. Um, uh, Liz Sabo, to my, to my immediate right, uh, has been at USA Today covering health, uh, health and science, but mostly health, uh, for uh, 11 years. Before that, she was at the Virginia Pilot, doing a lot of the same. Um, Scott Hensley, uh, second to the right, uh, to my right, uh, is at NPR. He runs the NPR Shots blog. Uh, which, of course, is about health. Uh, he was at the Wall Street Journal for a number of years before that. And Scott reminded me uh, just now that he also was on the flip side of this. Uh, we all kind of end up on the flip side of this, but he in particular in his previous life, before he went to journalism school, worked at uh, Siemens. He was actually uh, helped, uh, you know, in terms of clinical trials and things like that and would talk to the press pretty frequently. He may mention that as well. And then Julia Billus, to my far right, um, because Canadians are to the far right. Uh, we learned that, actually, <laughs> we learned that from, uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we learned that from one of our previous speakers, of course, from Tim. Um, uh, Julie is at Vox, uh, and, and she covers health and science there. Previously, she was uh, a night fellow uh, at MIT, and before that, worked at a number of uh, some trade newspapers and other, uh, other outlets in Canada. So I'm going to start with a general question, which is really about what this panel is about, and ask each of you to take it in turn in whatever order you'd like. But how do you go about choosing sources? What matters to you? I mean, we're thinking about this from the sort of lens of public trust. How do you decide who to trust and who to quote and who to rely on? Okay. Uh, one of the best sources is one who gets back to me really fast. Because um, I work for a, a daily, I started out working for a daily newspaper, and now I'm working for sort of an hourly, hour by hour, minute by minute, you know, on online publication too. So um, there are times when, uh, like when the first Ebola patient was uh, diagnosed, you know, an editor came over and he said, just two sentences, two sentences, and save. Um, so I had to write two sentences and save because then they could take the file and sort of get it ready and push it out on mobile and and uh, you know publish it for the sorry, publish it for the web so I need people who can call me back in a in, in a timely manner um, but the other people I look for are ones who are who are smart who know the answer to everything I want to ask um, and who can say it in the equivalent of like a, a tweet. <laughs> I mean, but basically who can, who can say something quickly and, and succinctly, you know, brevity is the soul of wit. There's some people who will call me back and who are super smart, way, 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 way smarter than I am. But when I ask them a question, it's like 20 minutes before they get to the point. Um, and there's really only maybe this many people who are, who are able, I think, to do research really well and communicate really well. So the reason you see infectious disease experts like uh, Tony Fauci and Paul Lafitte of Children's Hospital in Philadelphia quoted a lot, and Otis Brawley at the American Cancer Society quoted a lot, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, is because there's just not a lot of people who do it that well, who are super duper smart but who know how to explain their work like they're at a cocktail party. You know, I tell people, don't talk down to me. I'm, I'm a smart person. I, I didn't take physics in college, but I'm a smart person. Just talk to me like I'm at a cocktail party. And you've, you do something cool, and, you're, and you want all the people at the cocktail party to come around and listen to what you're saying. And there's not that many people who can do that. But if you can do all those things, then I'll be calling you a lot. I'll hit the button. Uh, I'll echo some of what uh, Liz said and maybe offer a few other things. Um, I'm looking for somebody who has the expertise for the story that I'm working on. I think we may talk about what constitutes expertise a little bit later, but I'm looking for somebody who's qualified and uh, who I can establish for the audience as the right person to be talking to about that uh, subject. Uh, availability is important. Um, it's astonishing to me how often it happens that a university or medical center will put out a press release about a study and then we'll call to say, me or somebody who's working on a story that I've assigned, will call to talk to the lead person and find out that person's traveling and they can't comment on the paper. It's strange. Uh, and I think 
Um, it's not a big deal, but availability, I just use that as an anecdote. Availability is important uh, if it's uh, representing your own work or if we're looking for somebody to comment on someone else's. Uh, I'm concerned about potential conflicts. Uh, everybody has an agenda. I don't have a problem with that. It's knowing what the agenda is and also being able to control for it in your lingo. So can we rule out a potential financial conflict? Is it an ideological conflict? Maybe there's a personal conflict. That might actually be a reason to talk to the person, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, especially for uh, broadcast, uh, you want somebody who's a good speaker. There's, we can do some editing, but the person has got to be able to talk with energy, can talk uh, clearly and succinctly about the subject, and whether it's for broadcast or print, uh, quotability uh, is not a bad quality in a potential interview subject. And then uh, I would throw into the mix uh, diversity. Uh, we would like to have uh, a mix of people, um, age, background, race. We're really looking to try and mix up the people who appear uh, on our website and who are on our airwaves. We would like to reflect more the audience that we would like to have and uh, think about ways that we can make the work that we're presenting more relevant to more people. And I think a diversity in the types of people who we bring to our air or to our website uh, can only help. Uh, also, gender. Um, just a few stats. I was looking over some of this today. The audience for uh, SHOTS, uh, which I run, is uh, half uh, 34 and younger which is probably old compared with Vox, but we're trying. And uh, it's about 60% women. Uh, and the majority of people uh, are looking at our, our uh, stories or listening to the stories, as the case may be, that are featured on shots uh, on a mobile device, either a, a tablet or a phone. So you know, we're trying to say, hey, look, this is where the audience is. Let's report on the stories. Uh, as faithfully and, and smartly as we can, but let's also be mindful of the audience. Uh, I will uh, throw one other category open. I mean, these are the kinds of things that I might be looking for in a, in a quick turn story, where it's sort of a study story, or where something's in the news and we need someone in a hurry. But there are a couple of other categories, and I'll just mention them. Maybe they'll come up more in the discussion. When we're doing a story that involves uh, an intervention, uh, or uh, a trend, we'd like real people. So we're looking for patients. Uh, we're looking for people who are affected by whatever it is that we're writing about, uh, where it would help enlighten the audience on, on the subject. And then there's another category, which is, you know, there are stories that we're doing where we're looking for sources who have inside information. I, I love uh, leakers. I mean, there are people who, uh, are concerned about things that they're seeing where they work or, or things that have happened to them, and they want to talk to us and enlighten us about something that hasn't been reported on before. That is a very uh, different and tricky sourcing area, and I think when it, when, you know, it comes back to some, some of the same principles, but you're really trying to assess, well, what is the expertise of this person to be uh, talking to me about this or enlightening me about this, what also, what is, you know, what is their credibility? Can they be, how do we trust that person and how do we vet what they're telling us, especially if it's confidential information, to make sure that we can go with it? So I'll, uh, maybe we'll talk about some of those things later, but that's my overview of the kinds of things we're looking for in sources and how uh, we might be looking for different kinds of sources for different stories. <coughs> Great. Um, so that was a fantastic overview, Scott and Liz, like timeliness, availability, um, ability to communicate, all those things are hugely important, which means I just called Dr. Oz for every story I write. Um, no, seriously. Um, but I, so I focus mainly on, on medicine, and um, uh, there, there are two things I think about. Um, one thing is, is this person, does this person always say the same thing? So for example, um, there are researchers who come out with studies sometimes and they somehow always have like a very particular 
bias. Um, and if I know that, for example, an anti-pharma bias, like a very strong big pharma is bad and info, like they can only talk about how pharma is negative, a uh, negative force in society. And if I know there are, if so, if I know that person is always going to kind of have that um, particular bias, I'm probably not going to go to them. I want someone who can keep an open mind and, and um, be kind of intelligent on different things. And obviously, we all have our biases, but it's something that I try to pay attention to. Um, and then the second thing, so reporting on health, when I started out um, to, to speak to Kit, Tim Caulfield's presentation this morning, that you know avocados are good for you one day, they're, kill or they're bad the next, coffee is um, going to extend your life on Monday, and by the weekend, it's going to kill you quicker. So very early, I started to go to systematic reviews of the literature, like um, Cochrane reviews, and seek out people who had a, a kind of broader overview of an issue um, who might have um, done some kind of meta-analysis or synthesis of the evidence. And I started to look to them and ask them about wh where the holes were in this um, whatever research question we were looking at, like what is known, what is not known, um, what, what are some of the big unresolved issues at the center of your field, and I found that meta-researchers were just hugely helpful um, uh, and also tend to, tend to have, in general, less of a conflict or agenda than people who are maybe focusing on one particular line of research. So. Those are two other things in addition to all the things that uh, Liz and, and Scott talked about. Great. Thank you. And I, I think this is a good opportunity for me to sort of say something that will be a segue to the next question I'd like to ask, which is um, that you, you see all, all three of these folks. And, and by the way, I, I should um, thank Liz in particular. I want to thank everyone, but Liz stepped in at the very last minute. Uh, another of our uh, scheduled panelists had a death in the family and, and just couldn't make it. So I really want to thank Liz for doing that. All three of, and, and me for that matter, but all three of the panelists are specialists, right? They all, uh, one way or another, have ended up covering, and, and you know, many of us for many years, a, a specialized subject, whether it's, you know, in, in all of our cases, really medicine. That's, you know, you go to the people you know. I mean, when I, you know, think about who should be on this panel, they're the people I trust, of course, and that was sort of part of the point. Um, so I want to flip this around a little bit and ask, the, the three of you to, to think for a second, and, and this, this anecdote came up earlier, although I don't know, we didn't go into too much detail, but someone asked about this recent story that came out in the New York Times. Um, Nick Bilton wrote about, you know, the dangers of, uh, the, the alleged dangers, I really should be careful, uh, of um, cell phones and, and cancer. And I think you all know this really created a firestorm um, because he had really relied almost exclusively, not quite exclusively, on um, someone named uh, Joseph Mercola, who's a, some sort of someone, doctor out in, but not the kind of doctor. He's an osteopath, which that's actually, I don't want to slim osteopaths, because actually a lot of osteopaths are providing tremendous primary care in this country. But um, he has a particular slant, a particular view. He also sells all sorts of supplements and things like that. Um, uh, he's been very outspoken in terms of uh, vaccines and um, autism and not on the evidence-based side, let's put it in that way. Um, but this story really relied, now Nick built in very well-known columnist, I don't know how many Twitter followers and people like that he has, but it's in the close to 100,000 or something. He's a very big name, has a lot of influence. Um, the public editor ended up writing, uh, New York Times, um, Margaret Sullivan ended up writing a column really lambasting him for having you know, gone after just using just one source. So well, that is a fairly long wind-up. Um, do you think that the choices that the three of you make um, are different uh, from the choices that a generalist reporter may make? Because one of the things I feel like I see a lot is people wade into stories that they may not know all the context about. And you know, we all make choices about, about sources, I'd like to think, based on a higher level of knowledge, to put it slightly. Um, you all work at you know, news organizations that do everything. Um, I actually don't anymore, since I love Reuters. But um, how do you, you know, what conversations you have with colleagues that sort of shed some light on this? Well, I, I think being a GA, being a general assignment reporter, is bar none the hardest job in the newsroom. Because think about your first day on the job. That's them every day. You know, their learning curve is straight up every day. One day they're like, hey, riots in Baltimore. Hey, hey, there's a, you know, something blowing up over here. You know, it, that's really, really hard to do. 
So I sympathize with them, but I also think, um, I, th I think some of the worst health reporting that I see is done by the non-specialists, and that sounds snotty, because of course I'm the specialist. Because we, we sort of know what to look for, but I think any reporter who's worth his or her salt, if they get, in, and, and reporters are under tremendous pressure. I mean, the, the idea of, I think the best reporting is usually done by specialists, but not always. Um, but there are fewer and fewer specialists. You know, there are fewer and fewer newspapers. We may not have a newspaper a year from now. We, we may just have a website a year from now. So there are fewer and fewer of us. So there's going to be more and more young, very young, very unseasoned, you know, people doing this job. And that's, and that's a, a tricky thing. But there's also an old adage in journalism that, you know, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Um, we're supposed to be we're supposed to be skeptical. You know, there's kind of a rule of three: one thing is is uh, an exception, two is a coincidence, three you've got a trend. So you've got to have at least three people. I mean, hopefully more, but at a minimum, you should be talking to at least three people for any story and for any side. Um, there's always going to be someone who disagrees. So it seems to me like even if this person wasn't a a health journalist, you know, the basic reporting skepticism, the thing you learn day one is you find the other side. Uh, I, I think the Bilton column is an example of multiple failures. It takes more than one thing to go wrong for a train wreck like that. And I think in the first case, uh, it was, would not have been hard to see why uh, Dr. Merkola was not the right person to talk to for that story. It boggles my mind, actually, that a person would, it, I mean, you could even call a person and talk to them and find out, oh, I made a mistake and then move on. But uh, to me, the bigger failure was an editing failure, which is it's one thing to, to uh, write a piece like that. It's another thing to uh, say, okay, let's publish that. And I think uh, in this case, it ran in the style section uh, of the New York Times, not the science section, not even the main news section of the paper. And so it went through, uh, as the public editor explained, a different editing channel. And I think the uh, editor of the piece acknowledged that it probably would have been a good idea to run it by their science colleagues. Uh, we had an example like this recently at NPR, where our ombudsman, a former New York Times uh, reporter, Elizabeth Jensen uh, took issue with a piece about um, mammography and uh, some legislation that was uh, would would modify guidelines on mammography, and that was a piece that came from our national desk, uh, excuse me, from the Washington desk, and didn't go uh, by the science desk, and it, it suffered from uh, being too political and not enough grounded in the the uh, evidence uh, around mammography screening pros and cons. So. Uh, it can happen anywhere, even in places where the journalism standards are high. Uh, journalism is imperfect, but I think there are usually, uh, to, 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 for a real whopper, it takes more than one failure. And, uh, and, and so I am concerned, as Liz is, about the hollowing out of newsrooms. It's harder and harder to find places that have the same checks and balances that existed even 10 years ago. You do have more and more people covering specialty beats. Uh, without ex experience and without that editing safety net. Um, I'm, uh, both Ivan and I are active in the Association for Healthcare Journalists, and we're seeing in our membership a rise in the number of people who are coming to us for help and education on a beat that they've been thrown into and that they, that they do part of the time, maybe in their town uh, or market they're covering hospitals, transportation, and I don't know, something else. It's, you, know, you never know how it's going to get uh, sorted out. So I think there is uh, much more opportunity for uh, errors in sourcing and errors in judgment on stories that are complex. Um, and I think it's something that we in the profession recognize, uh, but it's difficult to see how we improve it other than a story at a time, and take when we see things. I mean, I'm I'm grateful, for instance, for both the NPR ombudsman and the public editor at the at uh, the New York Times, uh, 
taking note of these stories and saying, look, here were some mistakes and let's try and figure out how they happen and, and point the way to avoiding them in the future. But there will always be mistakes. Um, so I guess on, on this idea of the specialist, so I find it terrifying, the idea of like covering the courts in the morning and covering medicine in the afternoon. I've been full time on medicine for about four years now, and I'm still very much learning about these meta debates in different areas that happen and how this researcher is kind of has this agenda that he's driving and you need to be aware of that and that you shouldn't call him. So I can't imagine um, the uphill battle, the, yeah, the general assignment people face every day. Um, on the flip side, I think that when we stay on a beat for a long time, we can sometimes have that, um, we, f we lose the freshness that our readers come to things with. Um, we lose sight of, like one thing we really try to do at Vox is bring things back to, like after months of reporting on Ebola, I was kind of going down rabbit holes of um, issues that I really cared about, that I knew the scientific community cared about. Readers were still basically concerned about the question of would they get Ebola or not on the subway, or these kind of very basic questions that I felt like I had learned and covered very early on. Um, but we had to find ways to keep kind of staying where the readers were. And I think that as specialists, sometimes we lose um, we can lose that freshness, um, but on, on the other hand, I do find, I don't know if you find this with your work with the association, but medical reporters tend to have almost careers, like they stay in this area for, like Helen Branswell, Andre Picard, all of you, they stay in, in this field for a long time because it is so vast and there's so many areas you can learn about um, and it's so complicated that you don't get bored very easily, so I guess, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there are certain beats, and, and I would say medicine is one of them. I think science is one of them, too, that attract people for various reasons, and people just sort of fall in love with it. Um, and they may fall in love with very different aspects of it, but they, they do. Um, I, I, the other thing I wanted to, you know, I'm sort of going to come back to this question about, and I think all this plays into it, in terms of trust and in terms of what our role is. I mean, this is a little bit, I don't know if it's metaphysical exactly, but it's a little bit, you know, uh, you know, cerebral. And that's something that I don't think the four of us have as much of a chance to, to be as we'd like on a day-to-day. On a -day. um, but you all work at, uh, you know, different news organizations that have, you know, different reaches in some ways. I mean, we might sort of on the surface say, well, USA Today, NPR, okay, you're both big, national, you sort of reach everyone. But I, I would argue, and Scott and, and Liz, please correct me if you're wrong, but I would argue that, you know, Scott has you know, because of what he's doing uh, day to day, probably a sort of subset of the NPR audience that, you know, it's a big subset, but a subset. You know, Julia, you're, you're at a new, it, it's not exactly a startup, but you're at this sort of new voice in, new Vox, new voice in, in journalism. Um, what, anyone really, and, and uh, you know, what is our role in terms of, in terms of trust, in terms of you know, the public conversation in science and what has changed in science and, and medicine? What, what has changed, uh, you know, in the time that we've all been in this industry in terms of that? Certainly we've seen internally the, the hollowing out, as, as you sort of both put it. But what about in terms of that, you know, it used to be, someone asked a question, but, you know, it used to be you sort of knew who to, you know, you would give a story to someone who would sort of get out there. I, I think that's, that's become atomized. But, what do you think in terms of just perceptions of, of the media, but more importantly, you know, perceptions of medicine and science because of what's happening in journalism? Like, information now is so balkanized that, um, like with the, with the internet, for example, when I started reporting with the measles outbreak in December in California, um, I started reporting on that and eventually wound up reporting out a feature on this new population of, or I guess they're not very new, but they're definitely becoming larger, vaccine delayers. So people who create alternate vaccine schedules for their children, and soon enough I learned that the number one children's health book on Amazon is um, called The Vaccine Book, a very innocuous title, but it's essentially an anti-vaccine book um, about how to delay vaccines, skip vaccines, don't tell other parents that you're skipping vaccines or else we're all screwed. Um, and, you know, I had no idea that this, this was so insanely popular um, because that this just isn't the world that I inhabit generally, <laughs> like a vaccine skeptical world. So I think, um, 
Oh, no, I'm like trailing off from the original question, but I think we're, we're in this age of like, yeah, extreme balkanization of information. So having kind of a, a trusted, having kind of sources that you can trust and go to becomes even more important. But we're competing, as, as Caulfield pointed out this morning, and um, Declan pointed out later, like you're, there's kind of celebrities, celebrity scientists, um, people's families, there's all these kind of influencers that come into play, and I think media is just one of them. Um, but I, but when, when you think about what, what our role is, I try to think about um, the public health impact of the work that I do. Um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that when I'm writing a story, people might take it as a prescription to try a new supplement or go out and try some procedure that I'm writing about or whatever it is. So I try to, you know, talk about balances, harms, trade-offs, um, report it out in a very uh, balanced way. Because, yeah, it's, it's insane how people read and listen to the news and then act on it. Um, so I think that answered both parts of it. But. I'd like to uh, reinforce what Julia said, that the, each story lives and dies on its own. There's a battle for attention, and whether it was published on NPR.org or Vox, you know, the, the, the people who come to it, only a small portion will come to that story from, for instance, the NPR homepage or from uh, Shots, the landing page, where we, we love and cultivate each person who visits uh, Shots as a destination, but we're also mindful of the fact that it's a single digit percentage of the audience. So. Uh, we're, we're out there competing for people's attention, whether it's with other news stories or, or uh, video games or emails or text messages uh, with the majority of traffic now coming from uh, mobile devices. I think the, uh, the intense battle has become even more intense. Uh, and I think one of the challenges for us is how do we uh, compete honestly uh, for that attention? How do we do stories that live up to our standards as a news organization? and still engage uh, the audience. Uh, I would say that uh, and a related um, piece, which involves some of, some of you folks, is that um, this, uh, this, this kind of free-for-all uh, for attention, this free-for-all, uh, creates an opening for many non-news organizations to put forth stories, videos, tweets, um, uh, press releases labeled as news services uh, that that to uh, many people can appear to be journalism and they may be very helpful and interesting and uh, yet they're not to my definition news because they're uh, produced by house organs or involve only the people who were uh, uh, employed by uh, the institution so uh, that's kind of a sidetrack thing, but I wanted to put it out there because I think uh, what both of these things say to me is that the, the, the label of where this thing came from, uh, while important, is less important than it was even a few years ago. And that when people are essentially shopping for information, they're not as, uh, they're not as, uh, they're not likely to go to the portal or to the original source as much as they are to look for the subject that interests them and see what comes up. Yeah, I, they, they call it SEO, search engine optimization. And there are people who give us lectures at the newspaper, at, at, at our websites, for uh, how, how you can write your story and populate the story field so that people looking up you know, Ebola will, will go to you and not the other 5,000 sources. I can tell you one thing that's changed, I think, um, for me is, um, was, was covering Ebola was the, the first time um, since, I don't know, maybe I was in college that I felt comfortable and like it was important to write a first person piece. And that used to just be verboten in journalism. You were either a columnist writing a first person opinion piece and there was supposed to be a wall, a firewall, separate from the, from the reporters. Reporters are facts and the opinion writers use facts but they're allowed to interject column, they're allowed to interject opinion. And for the past couple of years we've been, in, USA Today has been encouraging reporters to write these first take and first, first person pieces. 
Um, so I asked my editors, you know, is, is this okay? And, and they said, yeah, um, because I felt like none of my Ebola pieces by itself was gonna win a Pulitzer Prize, but I felt like my, the main good I did, hopefully, a little bit for the world, um, or at least I tried to, I probably didn't achieve it, was just to keep the nation's largest newspaper from going over the cliff into stupid land. Because I would watch CNN, you know, we've got screens all around, and it would say, you know, talking about the first Ebola patient, Thomas Eric Duncan, you know, where did he go, who did he see, who cares? As you know, you don't get Ebola from seeing something or seeing someone, you know, it was just, it was just awful. And I felt like the, the country sort of toggled from apathy to hysteria and back again. And I was trying really hard, I wrote these three first person columns to nudge people towards informed, engaged compassion. And I think I failed because people are pretty much back into apathy. But I think the one thing I did do was I kept us from going into stupid land because they had just laid off every other health writer at the paper. So I could have written whatever I wanted and nobody would have known the difference. Uh, I was working for the news team. So, you know, I'd tell them about Ebola and they'd like, wow, okay, that's, that's really interesting. It's like, okay, it's like, I hope I'm right because <laughs> they didn't know to, to challenge me on any of it. So I just got to write what I wanted to write on Ebola and I didn't have to write stupid stuff. And I felt, I felt like that changed. I felt like the hysteria changed something in us and in me that I felt like I wasn't advocating a political position. I was just trying to keep people from going batshit crazy. Sorry, it's late in the day, but <laughs> that's, that's what changed for me. Um, so I think uh, maybe I, I have sort of one more question that I want to open up to the, to the audience, uh, to all of you for questions. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, um, one of the things that I, I think uh, we've, we've started to see some, some research on and some interesting sort of people thinking about this a lot, certainly a lot of the people who are here today have done research on this, um, is, you know, the role of, uh, if you will, nuance, uh, the role of uh, context, the role of sort of telling the whole story that uh, our work, you know, and the work of, of other journalists can or the work of anyone really uh, publishing uh, material can have on what people think, um, can have an, on you know whether people trust or don't trust or you know what opinions they have. Uh, there's actually a paper that came out just I think a couple weeks ago that sort of talks about uh, that and, and the fact that actually nuance doesn't necessarily um, you know take away from the main image issue. But one of the pressures we're of course all under, and we talked about this earlier today is sort of, you know, this study and that study and the, you've got, a, you know, deadlines and all of these things that we're all very familiar with. Um, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, you look at Gary Schweitzer and his Health News Review and he's got 10 criteria for every story. I mean, I happen to think that most of them are, actually all of them are good. They're not all necessarily applicable to every story. That's, that's some of the rub, of course. But what do you all think about, you know, what effect context has. I mean, we're not, none of the four of us, I don't think, are writing Daily Mail-like headlines like you see on, you know, Cure, Kill or Cure that say that, you know, again, and by the way, I'd recommend that site to anyone who hasn't seen uh, Kill or Cure. It's a great send-up of all of the Daily Mail headlines that say what either causes or prevents cancer. Um, and it's, it's, it goes from A to Z because it's British, so it's all the way to it's really long, but it's it's quite cool because a lot of things apparently cause and prevent cancer. Who knew? Um, so, uh, what effect does sort of actually adding that context and nuance have? Because a lot of what I used to get when I was at Reuters from the main desk, not so much from our desk because it was our desk, um, was well, we need it down to 300 words and we needed to sort of say a certain thing and um, all that stuff you put in about conflicts of interest or about the other studies or about the weakness of this study. You know, it's just it's going to take away from it. Readers are going to get bored. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's uh, difficult for any one story to tell the whole story. So uh, when it comes to a complicated subject like what's happening with Ebola or what's happening in an area of research, um, I think you have to uh, try and uh, tell the bigger story a story at a time. Uh, you try and make each story as complete as it needs to be for the main point. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of Gary's and Health News Review. I also feel that um, it's difficult to check every box in every story. And in fact, I've said to people, I think a four-star rating is great. Uh, I think a five-star rating means you probably went too long. And uh, I think there are times where you know checking off the last box to get the perfect score there may actually be less of a service to the reader than saying we made an editorial decision to concentrate on these aspects of the study. Um, you know, when it comes to nuance, uh, We want to include the most important information, and we also want to keep the reader or the listener engaged. Uh, so I think nuance helps, and um, there's, a, there's a part of our craft that is all about picking what is the detail that will help make this story work. So you know, the whole idea of having an anecdote in a story, if the anecdote is representative and, and intellectually honest, then that's a storytelling technique that can really help people uh, understand something or connect with it. Uh, but you can uh, be a slave to the anecdote and pick the wrong one or try to uh, make an anecdote that's not quite right carry a story in the wrong direction or in the, uh, in the wrong way. So I, I, I worry about that. You know, I think uh, one particular uh, kind of story that's popular, uh, I think more popular now than ever and, and tends to be the kind of long story that people will stick with is a narrative. So, do, you know, a real story, not just here's our, you know, our piece for the wire or our quick hit on the facts that you should know about this study or this health topic. I think, um, you know, in the battle for people's attention, there is a willingness to read or to listen for something that's long if there's a narrative, if there's really a beginning, a middle, and an end where you, where you get to know characters, you see what happens to them or hear what happens to them, and then have a resolution after some conflict or crisis, there's, I mean, that's as old as time. So people will uh, give you more of their attention and along that journey, you can tell them more sometimes than you can in a shorter piece. Uh, but those are hard stories to do and you have to sort of pick like a, uh, a workman, what's the right tool for this job? And there are times where there's news and we want to get it out there as succinctly and fairly and quickly as we can and do justice to it. And then there are other times where I think, you know, Julia points out, you've been covering something for a month, you want to step back from it and try and synthesize it or something came up in your reporting and you, you want to go in that direction. So I, I, those are my thoughts. There's no one answer. I think we should be mindful of it. And I think you know, this is where journalism as a craft or an art um, is something that we, we try and, and figure out often on a gut feeling what will be the best way to tell this story and how can we do it justice with the time that we have. I actually think readers really crave the nuance in context. And I think one of the wonderful things about the web is that you can hyperlink. So you can say, um, like in stories, they'll often refer to the like, research methods of a particular study and say, if you want to read more about what an observational study or a randomized control trial is, click here. And then I have a post up explaining different types of research methods for the people who want more. So that's one of the the beauty of writing for the web. And the other thing we, we try to do um, is think about, OK, maybe not everyone is going to read the 5,000 word feature on this particular issue. But is there a way to think about maybe getting across some semblance of that nuance and that information in a two minute video? Um, could we put it into, at Vox, we have what's called card stacks that kind of give an overview of an issue. Um, so thinking about different entry points to stories, like, and I think that's very similar to what you, what you were kind of referring to, Scott, like having uh, maybe not one story doesn't have it all, but you kind of, they're all interlinked and interwoven, and readers can come to the web and kind of hyper, whatever, in that, yeah, this kind of hypertext environment and um, move through the different um, places and start maybe with different entry points depending on their level of knowledge coming to the story. Um, the anecdote is really interesting in health reporting because as many of you know, it's kind of like the, the lowest form of evidence and you really do have to think about is this anecdote representative of the issue you're speaking to? 
And oftentimes, when you think about bad reporting, bad health reporting, um, and oftentimes it's generalists, so I did, yeah, not to make this divide, but it's often generalists who get into trouble with this. Um, it's when they run with anecdotes. So in Toronto, we had a, an example at the, not the largest daily newspaper, the Toronto Star. Um, political reporters came at a story about the HPV vaccine, and they reported it like you would a political story. They had both sides of the issue. Um, they ran with patient anecdotes about people who felt they had been harmed. They misinterpreted um, the vaccine adverse events reporting database. They thought that any um, you know events that were reported to this database were kind of proven and true, and they reported it like that th this was evidence. And I think that was a really good example of how you can't, yeah, the medical stories are something very particular. Balance is often bias in medical stories. You have to think about where is the weight of the research and somehow represent that. And then also do it with a, com preferably with a compelling narrative so that people actually read it. So it's an interesting um, kettle of fish, I think. I, I want to hear Liz's thoughts in a second, but I also want to point out that Julia is being uh, characteristically modest. She actually, her reporting on that Toronto store, Star story, there were some other people doing it, but you, you really took the lead on that, uh, led to it being retracted, which is quite an unusual event in, in journalism. So. Um, yeah, well, I was just going to say anecdotes are the lowest form of evidence, but they're the, the basis of storytelling. So what, what I think it's just really important for us to make sure that our anecdote conforms to the evidence. So, you know, so we're, we're not going to pick the one kid who's supposedly, according to his mom, injured by vaccines, as opposed to the millions and millions and millions saved by vaccines. You know, you want to pick the one that's representative, because I think it's just sort of something in our brain that the social psychologist can tell me the, what the actual term is for this, but, but we see one thing and we extrapolate that to, to the whole world. So if, so if, like my colleague Rick Hampson is a, gifted, gifted storyteller, and in our mental health series, he did this incredibly moving and wonderful piece about one woman and her one son with schizophrenia um, that he called the fortunate mother and talks about why she considered herself lucky. She's lucky that her son hasn't, isn't in prison. She's lucky her son isn't dead. She's lucky her son has had only minor scrapes with alcohol and drugs. Um, and it went on and on in this litany. And you read that, and you don't need the voice of authority to say, so-and-so is not alone, which we overuse. right? The reader just sort of naturally says, ah, oh, mothers of kids with schizophrenia go through a lot. We, you know, People with schizophrenia go through a lot. So I, I think that kind of narrative is really important. And there's a reason why people will read that or read the first person piece in the Washington Post by the mother whose, whose daughter threw herself in front of a train after a, a long battle with bipolar, is people would say, oh, did you see that piece in the Post about the woman whose daughter killed herself? And nobody says, did you see that GAO report about you know, no, right? And, and both of them might be conveying the same information, but you need that narrative. You just have to make sure you're being true to the evidence. Great. So I, I'd like to, I want to leave some time. Um, there are two mics, as, as I think you all know. Uh, any questions for the panel? We could probably ask ourselves some more questions, but uh, if anybody wants to ask George. Yeah. Uh, George Matsumoto, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, you, you started off this panel talking about your sort of ideal source, and um, you know, I think, I think ideal would be lovely. Uh, and as Marsha pointed out uh, in this morning's panel, we need sort of this fabric of trust. And so I want to give you my ideal reporter. And I want to see if you think there's a way we could mesh these two ideals to come up with something good. To me, an ideal reporter is somebody who gives me time to respond and doesn't, rec doesn't think I'm sitting at the computer waiting for their email or telephone call. Uh, an ideal reporter is one, particularly with TV, is one who actually would give me the questions before they pop them, uh, so that I don't have that dog in the headlights stare uh, when the question actually comes up. And for me, in particular, the ideal reporter is one who might actually let me see the story before it goes to print. Because there have been so many times, and that's you're shaking your head. There have been so many times <laughs> when 
there's a, just a, a, a major mistake that it would have taken 30 seconds to fix, but because I can never see the story before it goes online, I get this, when, when requests come in, I'll say, well, you know, I don't want to do it. I don't trust you to convey my thoughts correctly and accurately. And so I think there's this breakdown in trust because we have these two separate ideals. And I, I'm curious whether or not we could put that together to get to a better relationship. Yeah, sir, sources are always asking us to, to see the story ahead of time. And let me tell you, as I mentioned, it's really, it can be really hard. Sometimes you can talk to someone for 20 minutes, and you're lucky to get maybe 10 words that are quotable. And that's not you. Everything you say is golden. Mm -hmm. um, but these other, these other people. Um, so, you know, you talk to them for 20 minutes, they give you 10, you know, or sometimes you're sitting there on the phone and they start out really strong and you're like, oh, good, good, this is a good quote, this is a good quote, oh, and it's dying. Mm -hmm. And then they go back into their jargon in the GAO report. So I'll send someone a quote, and, and I, you know, early in my career, before I was knowledgeable about this, and I'd get a nice, you know, 10, 20 word quote, and then they'd see it and they'd start adding to it and they'd ruin it. So that's one reason we don't do that. I mean, we, we, and the official reason is you know, there could be libel. You know, copy editors read our stories for grammar and, and clarity and, and accuracy and balance and, and libel. Um, but a lot of times sources just kind of mess stuff up or they start arguing with you. Now, if somebody is really worried and says, you know, can you read my quote back to me? Or, or they're really, you know, I mean, usually I will, if something is really is really complicated and I'm out of my element, I will ask, now is this the number you're going to be at at 4 o'clock today and can I call you, can I email, and I'll read the story to them because there's less of an impulse of the source to start tinkering if I'm just reading it. I say, I'm going to read it and you stop me if there's anything wrong and, we can, and I'll fix it together. But if I send it to them, they're going to start typing. So I, I think there is a way to compromise, but we, we really can't send the story out. Yeah, I don't think um, most uh, mainstream uh, publications will allow uh, pre-publication review. Uh, like Liz, um, when I'm doing an interview, if I'm uncertain about what the person is saying, I'll say, let me, let me make sure I got that right. And I'll read the quote back as I'm doing it. Uh, it's also the case that if there's a concept or numbers, I'll run those by them and say, what about this or that? Um, I make mistakes, but I think there are ways uh, for good reporters as they go along to do uh, checks of the important facts. The, the time is what it is. I mean, uh, we have, uh, we're in a deadline business and there, you know, I'm pretty upfront about, hey, this story we've got a couple hours or this story is something that's a feature and, you know, think about it and I'll call you in a day or two or I'll call you back after I have a little bit more information. Uh, I think it is possible to work together, but I think pre-publication review is for, for mainstream publications is not an attainable goal. I think uh, you can also judge the person you're talking to. I, I, I've been on, in your shoes. I've been a source. I've been interviewed. And it's, uh, you know, it's a little like dating. That first date is a little tough. You're trying <laughs> to figure out is the person you know, on the other end who I think they are. If you have the opportunity to work with a reporter more than once, then maybe if, even if they got a little thing wrong, you know how to work with them better. I think um, it is possible on the important things for you to assert yourself and to say, look, this is, this is important. I want to make sure that your story reflects this and, and you can make your, your points. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I would say one kind of ancillary topic is the whole idea of media training. So I would say that uh, a little bit of media training is a good thing and too much is deadly. It's the, the dose makes the poison uh, <laughs> quote. Um, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's helpful uh, for people who are not used to dealing with the press to get a little bit of a, hey, this is the process. And, and, and it, I think a little bit of media training helps a person organize their thoughts and do a little self-editing before they go into that interview, which, you know, you're going to have your, your, your one chance to make that first impression, just like dating. 
Uh, but if the person is so rigidly on like three talking points and won't come out of the box, and, hell, I got to bring it all back to the box, it's like I don't even want to continue the conversation. And that's the sort of the, you know, the LD50 of, of media <laughs> training. And um, so I would say um, you can do things to control the, your message, and some of that is good. But then you want to have a little bit of a conversation. And, um, and, and if you are very concerned about a part of the research that's complicated or where there's a real problem, call it out. Make sure that you tell a person, hey, look, I, I know this is going to come up. Let me talk to you about it. Boom. Those are my, those are my ideas. There will be mistakes. Uh, hopefully, they're small mistakes. I think you should also, um, you should also uh, not, if there is a mistake that's important, don't just walk away from it. It's, it's diplomatically difficult, but go back to the person and get it corrected, especially in the online world, unlike mm -hmm. print newspapers where it's like, oh my god, you know, it's out there. You know, it's, it's possible to correct something pretty quickly and to know in the story. The original version of the story said X, Y, Z, but it's really A, B, C. So those would be my thoughts. And just one last note, I think the most beneficial, um, we're, we're all lucky we have these kind of beats that we're following and I think there's real short termism in, in people, like I think thinking about sources, like you kind of need to think about it as an ongoing, like maybe find a few reporters who, whose work you really admire and trust and like and cultivate conversations with them and then get to know them and have an exchange of ideas and eventually you will be quoted probably pretty regularly and very accurately and those are the best uh, so those are the best sources I have and I have others who I've given that advice to and they ha now have great relationships with reporters who they trust and they can go to so get away from that like short term <laughs> kind of us versus them attacking mentality because most of the time we're just scrambling and trying to understand we're really not out to misquote or um, and so if you already have those relationships in place, we'll probably have better news for it. Thank you Yeah, very I, much. I would just add uh, before the next question, I, I always tell my, I tell my students exactly what Julia has just, I teach medical journalism at NYU, I've, I've done that for about a dozen years, and I always tell my students that you need to, in order to, and, and it's not, it, it actually helps reporters at least as much as it helps the sources to cultivate these relationships. And every time you end up on the phone with someone, think about what you might talk to them about next time. And ask them what's interesting. I know we can't always do that on deadline. I'm not unrealistic about that. But it's people like that that you sort of talk to all the time and get great story ideas from that's very valuable. But there is the short termism, especially when you've got, you know, my again, my students, they graduate and, and they're very fortunate. They're they're, they're terrific, of course, because they're my students, and you should all hire them. Uh, but um, some of them end up in jobs where they're writing, you know, four blog posts a day or, or something like that, five blog posts a day. Um, you know, trying to think long term is, is thinking about three hours from now, and that, you know, we can't, you know, that, that's not sustainable either. David. So just one quick thing on that. I mean, I, I actually wouldn't, maybe it's because I'm a former long ago reporter, but I actually wouldn't trust a reporter who was willing to send me their article because they'll do it for somebody else too. I mean, it's just sort of, it's bad for, I mean, if the reporter is willing to send me my quotes back, which they especially will do if I've gone on and off the record so many times that even I can't remember which was which, but um, I, I don't, the, sending the story back, I share your concerns. So I have a different question though. So um, uh, you got into this a little bit toward the end, but um, well, there are certainly some things that are unique about health and science reporting. I want to lay this out real quickly and then see what you think. I mean, which is that it's really more like other reporting than not. I'm a little bit worried about making it seem like, again, like the special realm where, oh, poor scientists have to deal with this. Um, even in the political world, I mean, as someone who both on the Hill and now works on legislation, I mean, you get the same thing, like, will you please read this bill? It, Someone may say this and someone say, may say that, but there are some things the bill just doesn't say. You know, it's only two pages. Read the damn thing. It's not like the Health Care Act. Um, and, um, and there's those same kind of things about how do you deal with the anecdote and how do you deal with, you know, it sounds too much like a GAO report. How do you deal with the, you know, the, the case study that led to the bill without making one person's argument or coming up with some ridiculous thing that's not really what the state of the law is? So I don't want to overstate the analogy, but if you guys would talk a little bit through 
the way in which, you know, science is not a one-of-a-kind problem, maybe that would be helpful for people. I, I'd love to uh, jump on that. Uh, my first journalism job was for a uh, banking trade newspaper, and I covered mutual funds. And I was interested in business reporting. Uh, at the Wall Street Journal, I covered the intersection of health, business, human genome project, and it was kind of my ideal beat. Uh, but it was funny, I didn't think, and I had an interest in health and then thought of myself more as a future health reporter, but the first job is the first job. And after a few months doing it, I realized that, you know, the differences between healthcare and investments weren't as big as I thought, that some of the roles that people had were the same. So the investment advisors and brokers were the doctors. The investors were the patients, and it was the SEC instead of the FDA. But the principles of how to investigate the conflicts of interest, uh, what were people's stakes in what was the informed consent even, uh, in the sense of buying this mutual fund versus having a procedure done, they weren't all that different. And so I think the, uh, there are some elements of health and science reporting where it helps to have some special specialty knowledge, but when I look at my colleagues at NPR, and I think back to the people I worked with at the Wall Street Journal, we had some people who had scientific training. In the case at NPR, we have a couple of people who have PhDs in scientific disciplines, but there were other people who were history majors or English majors who are every bit as good as, as reporters and journalists. Uh, and I think it's uh, a lot more to do with the thought process and the sort of uh, skills of reporting and writing and how do you weed through this stuff that really carry, carry the story in the end. It, it, it is off-putting, though, for many people to deal with numbers, for many journalists to deal with numbers. Our audience is actually, too. But, you know, it can be off-putting for people to deal with numbers. It can be off-putting for people to say, wow, I, how would I write about genetics? I don't know anything about that. Um, it, it is a, an extra challenge, but it's possible. Uh, I like your point a lot, and I think we should not uh, make this a special club or cult. I think with the right skills and good attitude, uh, it is possible to, uh, for a person who is not specially trained in science to write and report about science. Uh, and to Julia's uh, point earlier, it's good to have fresh blood and fresh perspective on these beats. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think journal I think health journalism is like any other field, and that you need to try to get it right, and you need to be skeptical, and you might not know the history of the anti-vax movement, but you know you know there are two sides, or three sides, or four sides, or five sides, and you got to at least get two, um, and you got to get the numbers right. You got to print out the report. And you got to check what you've got and check what someone else has. And if I tomorrow have to start writing earnings reports, which I pray to God I will not happen, um, but we've, we're only going to have like four people on the money desk next month in, in Tyson's. Um, if I have to start writing earnings reports, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be really sweating, and I'm going to be calling up people and saying, "Can you tell me if I've got this right?" And I think as a journalist, whatever you're covering, you need to be really humble. And you need to remember that the way not to make mistakes is to know that you could make a mistake and to not think you're perfect, right? So, and, and the way, you can never be unbiased, but the way to be less biased is to know that you can never be unbiased. So you check yourself for what your bias is. But if I had to, you know, and a lot of times I'll, I remember I interviewed a biochemist who, I was asking him to, I was telling him how I needed to put something in layman's terms, and he said, oh, you've got to dumb it down. And I said, I need a lingua franca. I don't need to dumb it down. You know, be honest, how many of you can read your mutual fund prospectus? You know, how many of you struggle when you pay your taxes? Doctors are sort of stereotypically bad at finances, and, um, you know, everybody has an area of expertise. And so what we try to do is bring it down to a level where really smart people. I mean, my father-in-law has two PhDs. He doesn't know about statistics. They're both in, like, linguistics and cultural studies, and really, really smart people can can still read common material. Um, so, I, and and I, I, I wish people, even, even though we're all 
really rushed. And you know, if somebody has to write three stories a day, nobody comes to work wanting to do a bad job. But their forces, the forces being including things like, you know, our Miley, our Miley Cyrus twerking story. I don't know about yours, but ours got 14 million page views. That was more than Newtown. I don't, I don't come to work. I didn't go to the University of Virginia to write about Miley Cyrus. But the bean counters upstairs who drive to work in Lexuses and Rolls Royces, they look at that and they think, you know, what does the public want? You know, they want Miley Cyrus. Um, they want that. I mean, so there are a lot of pressures when you look at the media and think, what, what is on your site, Liz Sabo? These are the pressures. Um, but I think people have to be willing to at least do a Google search, no matter what you're doing. And I did a big investigation of this doctor who's very, I'm in public and I could be quoted, so I'll say controversial. Um, his critics call him a snake oil salesman. Not me, but his critics call him a snake oil salesman. And he's gotten tons of great publicity from little local reporters because um, when their children have an incurable brain tumor and they're going to die in six months, they Google him and for whatever reason, they find out about this guy who wants $20,000 cash or check up front, $100,000, $150,000, $300,000 you know, over the full course of treatment. So the first thing these parents do, what would you do? You start raising money. You have a website. You have a GoFundMe site. You need to tell people about it. They call the local Chesapeake Bureau reporter out in the sticks. And some 22-year-old thinks, oh, of course I'll help you save your kid. He's adorable. So they write this uncritical story about this wonderful maverick down in Houston who can save this kid. And wouldn't it be great if we all helped them raise $100,000? Talk about people driving Lexuses. Um, you know, and, and I just think, couldn't one of those reporters have Googled this guy to see what his background was, to know there's a little bit of controversy before we just funnel money towards him? So I, I hope everybody, I hope all reporters can just use those basic principles. All right, so we've heard about um, dating, poisoning, um, le Lexuses, Lexi, um, all sorts of. All of your uh, yes, every, everyone, you, if they're used, if they're used, Lexuses. Um, well, I just, uh, we're actually out of time. It's 5 o'clock, and I know that um, we all have drinks to have or dinner or something, but I want to thank our panel. Thanks very much for sharing your, your thoughts and advice. And,